Hi, this is Seth Mosley. I'm here on the campus of Lipscomb University with my new friend, Missy Gallimore. We're here on the Made It in Music podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, love it. Yeah, I'm sure. so excited to hear your story. I've just been getting to know you a little bit, and I know our audience is going to love hearing it as well, too. And um, I just want to start with a very simple question, mm -hmm. and feel free to go in depth as the, with the answers you want, but how do you find great songs? Hard work, uh, listening to a ton of songs a week, um, hitting the ground, going to every publisher, uh, even if it's the tiniest little publisher. Um, and usually when they're like tiny publishers, I'll just say, look, you know, send them to me. I can listen to them quicker than, you know, having just to go and sit down and listen to a bunch. Just send me your top five. But it's basically just... Um, relationships with these publishers and just getting in there every day, every other week, uh, staying in contact with them, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, so, it's good. Well, we'll, di um, we'll dive a lot more into that. I, I, wanted, yeah. I wanted to ask that first just yeah. because that's a lot of what we're going to be talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's a and, lot on relationships with yeah. publishers too, you know, just keeping that relationship and um, the, the productivity and how, you know, a lot of times – you'll talk, you know, publishers will feel like they've, you know, they meet a dead end, either whether it's at the label, they can't get answers or, or management or whoever. But for me, I just feel like it's very important to always get back with publishers, regardless if, if it's a pass or whatever. But I think it, I feel like it's very important to have communication yeah. with, um, with all publishers. Yeah. And, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I want to hear more about that, but I want to zoom back in time. Mm -hmm. What was the first moment where you can remember music impacted you and you knew you wanted to be involved in it? Oh, man. I can read. Oh, God. Oh, let's see. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't. I mean, music was never. I mean, I was. It was. This is kind of like just all happened by chance for me. I started. I had applied for a position at a law firm, and they didn't hire me. This is like right when I had gotten out of college, and but they had pat they liked me well enough that they passed my resume on to Billy Sherrill. I don't know if you guys know who Billy Sherrill is, but he produced George Jones, Tammy Wynette. I mean, he was huge a long, long time sure. ago. Sure. And so uh, I get a call one day from his lady that's worked with him for years, and he's and she's like, "Hey, well, we'd love for you to come in and do an interview at CBS Records at the time with Billy Sherrill." I had no idea at all, I, you know, music, whatever. Uh, I'm I just, you know, I just I love music, yeah. but I never was like, you know, just I always thought I was going to go down a different road. But anyway, I, ca I went in. I, you know, I remember driving down 16th Avenue, and I remember the house. And I, I was seeing all these old houses, and I was going, oh, my God, it was like 6 o'clock at night. Oh, God, what have I gotten myself into? This looks real shady. This is, you know, I was having all these thoughts. So I walk in, and I go upstairs, and Billy is sitting there in his office. And do you guys know the artist? Charlie Rich. Do y'all know who Charlie Rich is? It was a huge, the most beautiful girl. Okay. Uh, huge songs back in the day that Billy produced. And I remember Billy, I was sitting down and he first, he's like, would you like a glass of champagne? And I'm thinking, oh God, here we go. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. I'll take a glass. And he's like, um, I'm going to play you something. And it was something he had just cut on Charlie Rich. And I had no idea who Charlie Rich was. I mean, you know, no country music was not even on my radar at the time. And he's like, what do you think about this song? And I just pause for a minute and I go, well, I really don't like it. That's all I noticed. I just don't like it. And he's like, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and so he hired me and I worked at, uh, I worked at CBS records for a while with George Jones and, and, um, all the people that he produced, David Allen Coe, all these people that would come in that he would produce at CBS Records. And I remember he was almost like a father figure to me because mm. he would always say, you stay away from Johnny Rodriguez. Or, you stay away <laughs> from David Allen Coe. He's a bad one, you know. Yeah. And uh, But I really cut my teeth on Billy, and he was a producer, and he worked in A&R mm. at the time. And he was, he was a huge producer, but, you know, huge songs of, on George. Um, what's some of George's biggest songs Billy did? Um, 
I can't even think right now. Yeah. But anyway, I just kind of cut my, I, I knew nothing about it. I just felt like I was just kind of thrown in and I just, you know, it just, just kind of started building from there. And I went from there to publishing and, yeah. uh, and it just kind of, kind of went from there. Yeah. So, what, what do you think it was about that first interaction where he asked if, do you like this song? You said, no. Was he just looking for somebody who was really picky I, musically? I think or he what? was just looking for somebody that probably just didn't know what the crap they were doing and wasn't <laughs> like a songwriter or wasn't all involved in the music industry and all up in it. You know yeah. what I mean? And I think that's, I just had no experience, nothing. And I think I was yeah, I just think when, yeah, he, and it was immediately, you're hired, you know, but yeah, I just think he was looking for someone who just wasn't going to hound him all the time probably and sure. didn't have a clue what was going on. That's awesome. So so today, what exactly are you doing in the business? It's a lot of um, things. But. Well, still, I mean, uh, A&R um, for Tim McGraw, Keith Urban, that's the two, and th that's the two main guys that I do A&R for, I, you know. I would like to pick up maybe one more client, but it I'd have to be very picky on who it would be. I don't want to water myself down. I've had several people reach out about some things, but it's not it would have to be it would have to be someone a and r who I felt like I could really, really help mm. and um then I would think about doing it but I mean it's just a lot of responsibility mm. and um hard work and it's it's tough right now it's tough finding those little gems um uh i, I started working for keith um on the ripcord album mm. yeah i came in late on the ripcord album he had already recorded a ton of things and i thought oh my god how am i ever going to be able to pull off you know, finding songs from he's always got, he's already cut a lot, he's cut outside songs. Mm. And I was lucky enough to get four or five songs on that album, and goodness gracious, Blue was one of them. Mm. And so that was a big deal. That was probably ended up being busted, but his biggest song of his career, and it's an outside song. Yeah. Um, so that I came in on that and then started working for the album that's out now. And what was the question again? <laughs> no, it's yeah. Uh, what 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 exactly are you doing? Oh today? yeah, yeah. Like so the, the, that that still kind of like pays the bills. Sure. You know, that's just kind of. But I I still love it. I still get so excited when I hear a great song. Sure. You would think after all these years that I would be so jaded. Yeah. But I'm not. I feel I just get. I, I play it a million times in the car. I'll I'll bring Brianna out to the car and say, listen to this, and I'll listen to it over and over, and I get still get so excited about hearing great songs. So, but then my other thing that I'm doing, I I feel like I'd kind of peaked there and I wanted to do something kind of itching to kind of do do something different and I've always loved publishing um I'd always loved uh a and R. I've always not really familiar with management but always thought kind of with publishing that's what publishers are doing now they're kind of like doing everything now sure and um Gary just came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in um starting an artist development company with him and I'm like, sure. Hmm. So um, we've been going like two years now. Hmm. Um, yeah. So what, what motivated you to do that? Because obviously going from, you know, working with people as established yes. as Tim yeah. and, and Keith yeah. to, to a lot of people who are, I'm assuming, from the ground up yes. with these development deals. What what was the thing that motivated you to do that? To do this d d thing with Gary, yeah. you mean? Yeah. I was just kind of, I don't want to say tired of doing the same thing all the time because I, I feel like. I still get really excited, but it was, it was just, I just felt the urge to just to do something different. Still wanted to do my A&R, but just dip my toes out in something else and try something else. I just, sure. it's just time. It just comes with age, you know, it just sure. comes with, you know, confidence and feeling that confident to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and, sure. and try something new. Yeah. So that's so kind of a new a new a new challenge, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And ha and how is how is that being? That's that's a relatively new thing. It's new. It's hard. I just have to tell you right now. It's it's really really hard. Um, um, it's harder than ever right now. It's the most exciting to me too. Still, because I still think you can have all these hits and these artists can break without labels now. 
but um, it's still it's it's just it's it's hard, but it's also invigorating and exciting too. Mm. Like, um, yeah. So what what are what are some of those biggest challenges of of developing new artists nowadays? The biggest challenge is freaking getting them a deal because I feel like you still have to have the record label. You still have to have a big record label. You still have to have them mm. for radio, sure. terrestrial radio right now. It still is. You still have to have them, in mm. my opinion. Yeah. Um, so, but labels are moving so so slow now. They just take forever and they can't commit. I'm working with a guy by the name of... Um, Shy Carter. I don't know if you know who Shy yeah. Carter is, yeah. but I'm working with him and I'm managing him. Mm. And it, th this guy is an incredible, incredible artist. He's an incredible songwriter. And he's, we've been working the past year on his artist project. And as good as he is, um, it, it's getting these labels. They all love what they hear, but you know, they want to see everything. They, you know, they just want to have you, the product finished, turned into them. Yeah. They want the whole thing done. So what, you know, yeah, that's, and that's yeah. what I was going to ask. What are they, what are they actually looking for that these artists don't? I, I, I don't know. I, I really, I, I, I beat my head up against the wall all the time on this. I don't, you know, I don't think they even know what they're looking for. I think they're looking, you know, they look obviously at the streamings, what artists are streaming the highest, which, I, I don't know why they put so much faith in that. What's, what, sure. what, what, you know, what, what happened to just hearing a great artist, hearing his songs and knowing and going with your gut and saying, I'm signing this guy. Sure. Sure. Let's go for it. Let's, let's roll our sleeves up and let's make this guy. Let's, let's, yeah. you know, let's make this guy a star or whatever. But you just don't see that anymore. Yeah. Um, and especially with Shy, you know, we got labels interested, but just, you know, Getting it across the finish line is really hard. Sure. And then you look at some guys who just get signed just like that, and you just yeah. go, you just there's no rhyme or reason. Mm. There's no rhyme or reason. I don't know. So, what does the development process look like for at least how you guys are? Approaching well, that? how we're approaching it is, um, I'll just use Shy for an example because he's the furthest along. Um, you start with getting you start with great songs it's still all about great songs you mm -hmm. get a great song you're gonna break you have one song chris jansen great friend of mine i had publishing on buy me a boat oh, okay. he was doing absolutely nothing mm. before he had that song wow. um her uh, kelly his wife is my best friend she sent the song to bobby bones mm. bobby bones played it and it's look, what it, did. look what it did yeah. the rest is history yeah. Yeah. so um it, it it just all starts with rolling up your sleeves, getting these artists in the right writer's room, strategically putting them with the right writers. Um, that's where it starts. Mm. That's where it starts, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, it all goes back to finding finding great songs. Regardless so, if they write them or not. Well, and that's what that was going to be my question, because a lot of artists nowadays, and maybe you want to speak into this a little bit, but you know, a lot of artists are very insistent on writing their own stuff nowadays or at least being a co-writer on it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um is that part of the conversation that you're having with your artists that you're developing uh yeah i mean i encourage the artists that i'm working with cut outside songs mm. cut out the 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 biggest keith's biggest song was blue ain't your color outside mm. song miranda's biggest song that she had the house that built me outside song um mm. uh, who else um I can't even think. Those are like the two that yeah. just just come to mind. Yeah. But um, it's still don't don't turn away from a great outside song. So the artists and, and they're very the artists that I work with are you know very receptive to that. They're very open mm. to that. I mean, they'd be stupid not to. Yeah. And there's some artists that aren't. Sure. They just won't consider it. And I sure. just like scratching my head, going, I just can't believe that. Sure. But. The quality, yeah. the quality of the songs, it's, yeah, probably suffers as a result mm -hmm. of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's talk about what are what are some of the accomplishments that you that you are most proud of in your career? You've, you talked about Tim and Keith. Is there anything in either of those stories that you're like, this was 
this was a big win. Well, the blue ain't your color was a big win. That yeah. that was probably the the that was probably the biggest. Just coming in cold for Keith yeah. and being the artist that he is, and finding this song for him was just huge. And I have to say, Keith is the sweetest. The I I would get texts from him just about every other day thanking me for wow. pitching him that song. He is the sweetest guy. But I don't know. There's not. I mean. That, probably that. I yeah. Mean, yeah. What, what was probably. the story behind that? How did that? Oh, it was just random. It was a snow day. I was at home with my kids. And when I'm at, you know, if it's a snow day and I'm at home, I'm always listening. And I was just listening. And Nate from um, Cornman Music, I was supposed to have a meeting with him that day. And it because of the snow got canceled. So he just sent them to me. Okay. It was nothing. I just heard the song. Like, okay, I'd like to put this on hold for Keith mm. and send it to Keith. He immediately text me back and said, oh, I love this. I don't think Keith even realized hmm. at the time that it would, you know, do what it did. Wow. Um, yeah. Live Like You Were Dying is another one. Uh, hmm. I can remember right where I was. Where were you? When I got the call about you really need to get over to the studio and hear this song. Craig just demoed. It was Chris Oglesby. Hmm. He was working for Craig at the time. And I was getting on interstate at Demumbrium hmm. to go home. It was around 5 o'clock. And Chris called and he says, I just heard a song. I think you really need to jump on really quick. And in those days, it was like, oh, my God, I got to get to this. Like, before somebody <laughs> else gets the song, I got to go and hear this song right now before somebody else puts it on hold. And <laughs> it was just like constantly. And so I d drove to County Q. I don't know if you – I don't even know if County Q is still doing demos over in Berry Hill. But, to be honest, I, I don't know. But anyway, I went to the studio. Craig was in the studio. They had just record, just demoed the song. I heard the song, put it on hold for Tim immediately. Mm. got it to Tim and huge yeah yeah so yeah. there were moments yeah when I you know there's can remember like sure yeah yeah but though yeah well those are the, and those are massive successes so yeah how how many would you say of, of songs that you get is there like a, a typical ratio of like how many songs do you get pitched versus ones that you actually like okay this one yeah I, I'll, I'll put on hold for Tim or Keith or whatever artist you're working on? Um, I don't know if this answers your question, but I would say I will be lucky nowadays if I, I mean, probably even less than this, but if I could get one song, just one great song a month, wow, that, that would make me really, really happy. And that's mm. probably not even now. That's like, wouldn't happen. Wow. Yeah. Why do you, why do you think that is? Just th th um, I don't know. I guess I I really don't know. I just don't know. I just don't. I think I, I think the writers in town, the publishers in town and the writers in town, they're the ones that have to change what's going on right now. Hmm. They've got to quit writing this stuff. They've got to quit writing the truck songs and the <laughs> the whatever they are, you know, but you know, yeah. they're the ones that make this makes the wheels turn here and they're sure. going to have to quit chasing everything. Mm. And um, that's that's how I look at it. But, yeah, that's uh, good. You know, that's they, good. They're always chasing something. Yeah, you know, chasing like, like a a trend that they yes, think is everything yes. They're has chasing to fall a trend this. that they, yeah, yeah yeah interesting. Yeah. Hopefully the uh, I don't know. Have you have you guys seen the video that's going around about the snaps? Yeah, like in the country songs. In the like country it's songs, every... how it's ruining all the country songs. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah, so now, you know, I'm really glad, you know, if I'm talking to Gary, because I know Gary probably hears it a lot more than I do being in the Keith world, but, you know, radio is really starting to not want to hear those type songs anymore. They're mm -hmm. one, it's going back to country, yeah. which I think is really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Um, even when we were just talking before the interview, you have a lot of advice in, in the vein of like stay the course, just keep mm -hmm. keep doing your thing. It's something a lot of musicians really need to hear. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. that kind of advice that nobody really wants to get because it's just like, okay, I know it's persistence. It's persistence. But can you can you talk a little more about that? Um I, you know, I I'll tell you a story on Tim. And I won't say who the person is, but when Tim first came to town, this is before he was working with Byron, he worked with a producer and he went in the studio and this, this producer told Tim that he would never work in Nashville, 
that he needed to pack his bags and go back home, hmm. that he would never work. Wow. And, oh, my gosh. And Tim still to this day remembers that. Wow. And remembers, you know, and just it's just, it's just hard work and staying true to you and staying – don't give up. You just you just can't give up. I mean, God, Chris Stapleton was here twenty years yeah. before he got that moment with Justin Timberlake mm. on the CMT stage. Yeah. That was, I think, not CMT, CMA. The CMAs, yeah. Um, yeah. There was that moment, and that you know, he was here. He was around for twenty years. And Byron used him on backgrounds, and yeah. you know, he was he was doing you know just writing, and yeah. I mean, it's just you just gotta yeah. keep going. Just yeah. got to keep going. So what what is it when you're talking to one of your artists, um, you know, shy or a- anybody that you're developing, what does that conversation look like on a day-to-day basis? Because I'm sure that's something you're having to reiterate to them probably pretty regularly. Yeah. I mean, the shy, not so much, but so the, the younger acts, for sure. Mm. Uh, track 45, Abby Cohn. Um, you know, you've just got to... And there's such, and these guys, like, like there's such, it, with, with this generation, it's just a generation of putting stuff out now. Mm. They just want to throw stuff out, mm. you know, throw one thing out without a backup plan. Mm. You know, they just, it's so constantly having to say, hold up, let's, let's, let's back up. You know, we got this great song, but you got to have stuff behind it to back it up. Mm. Uh, just keep, keep writing. Let's keep getting you in this room. Let's keep getting these songs and let's just get the songs together. Then we'll go cut. And it's just a constant. It's a constant. Yeah. And then if they don't, if their calendar's not full, then, you know, they get freaked out because they don't have rights in their calendar. Yeah. And <laughs> they just always feel like they've got to keep, you know, be doing something, be doing it. So sure. it's, that's. I don't know if I answered your question. No, or it's, not, it's but, uh, that's the, well. It uh, sounds like the, it's a lot of reminding them that re, the songs, like you, you, that, that has to be it. That's yeah. the king. So I'm really hard. Yeah, I'm really hard, and sometimes it's really, really hard for me to take my A and R hat off and kind of like put my publishing hat on because I have a couple of publishing companies as well, and uh, I'm really hard on my writers. And it's sure. it, I don't mean to be, but I just feel like I know what these artists are looking for, mm-hmm. and I know what you got to be writing, and and. I know what it's going to take to get a song cut. Mm. And sometimes it's really hard, though, for me to, to, to really take my A&R hat off and put my publisher hat on. Or, you know, I hear, I hear, I hear great I hear the A, what they think is the A songs, sure. you know, these great songs. But, but um, that's a real struggle for me. Sure. Of having to play the two you know, the publisher and the A&R person. Well, for people who, who maybe don't even under, understand the differentiation, what, what do you mean specifically by that? Like, well, my what are a- those two just hats? the A&R hat, like I work, I mean, obviously I work for two of the biggest um, entertainers and, you know, you're going to get pitched the top drawer stuff. You're going to get pitched the great songs. Sure. Um, so I hear these songs, the few that I hear, yeah. um, so I'm always comparing what my writers are doing to these great songs. Mm. And sometimes that's really hard because that's too hard. But, but like I said, I, you know, um, I just feel like I know what the song, I know what it's going to take to get these songs cut. And it's so hard to get outside cuts now. Sure. Um, so it has to be a really special song for, yeah. for some of these um, writers to. Sure. Know. So for your for your with, with when you have your publishing hat on, are you thinking um, less about pitching just for literally just straight outside cuts and more about just booking them in co-writes or what's what is your thought process? Well, when, like for my publishing company for writers that I that I publish, uh, obviously I'm just listening, you know, for who all right who can we pitch this song to? Sure. Um, and for um, the artist that I'm working for. Um, like for instance, Abby Cohn. Do you guys know Abby Cohn? Stacy, do you know? Do you know Abby? Um, she's a uh, just turned twenty year old. She's she's great. Yeah. Um, she, you know, she gets so upset with me because I'm like, these are these are really really good. Gary's the same way. You know, we have these conversations. These are great, but you we, we got to get that one song that just has that fairy dust. Yeah. I, there's no rhyme or reason about it. it. Just they just do. They they just come in. They just have that little 
hit to them. Yeah. They just have that little whatever it is. Yeah. Well, let me, let, yeah. and let me dig into that. What? And this is the million dollar question that everybody wants to know. But what what makes a great song? How do you define that? Oh, uh, it could be as country. I, I, you know, that's just a really hard question because yeah. it could be a melody. It could be something as simple as "Meant to Be," who was just very simple. Yeah. But such a sing along hit. Yeah. You know that you could just really not think about it and just sing along to it. Mm. So I don't know. Um, I I don't know what they. I don't know. Yeah. That's some honest answer. I don't know what ha- makes them have the little fairy dust. What makes it's. I have no idea. It just has a thing. You kind of you kind of know it when you hear you it. You just know it when you hear it. You really do. I do. I just know it when I hear it. Yeah. So yeah. it's a hit chorus, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For it, me, what I'm always looking for is a lyric that is slightly out of the box a little bit. Hmm. For Keith, I'm looking for a lyric that is raw and honest. Um, that's really – and simple. And that's really hard for Nashville writers to do mm. because they also they all want to get a little contrived in mm. their lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe to be too poetic or artsy yeah. so that like yeah. when when you go play it at a writer's round, you can impress yeah. your your friends. Yeah. And with yeah. this lyric, this line is so cool or whatever. Yeah. Like I was pitched a song the other day and we were laughing about it and I stopped <laughs> the plugger and I'm like, in the in the line if it was for Keith. <laughs> The line, one of the lines in the song was said, Mary, Mary, quite contrary. And I looked at that publisher and I said, Keith would never say that line. <laughs> he would, he's never going to sing Mary, Mary, quite contrary, you know? Wow. So it's just a lot of, a lot of the Nashville songs are very contrived. So it's really hard for writers to really find that simple lyric mm. that is a hit. Wow. But, oh my God, if I would have had the house that built me to me, that is yeah. like, yeah. Oh my God! What a song. Yeah. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. back in Mama's, mm-hmm. what a freaking song. Sure. Tom Douglas. Yeah. Yeah. He's the master. He's so pretty so much, good. Tom Douglas is the answer for that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! But now I've heard some things of Tom's. It's not very good either. Sure. You know. But um. Yeah, and he and he'd be the first person to tell. You. He's been on the podcast, mm-hmm. and he's the first person to tell you that nobody's bulletproof, right? Yeah. We, we all, you know, and even him. I mean, how how many songs out of all of them have been his big ones, like just those few, right? Yeah, a few. And, you know, a lot of his things, you know, they sound alike, melodic, you know, melodic wise, a lot of his things sound alike. So it's really, his publishers really need to work with getting Tom with different people that can push him melodically because mm-hmm. a lot of times his th- his his songs sound melodically sure. alike. Sure. So. But he, I mean, Lord. Um, when he delivers one, it, it it's it, yeah. It works. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's quite a few actually. For Tim's cut quite a few of his. Yeah. So you yeah. T- you talked a little bit about in the in the intro just finding great songs. It's mm-hmm. it sounds like it's it's fairly just you know meet with the publishers and. It's just yeah. It's just it's all about your relationships with the publishers and if you get results, which I do. Mm. They're going to pitch you the songs. Sure. They're going to pitch me the songs before they're going to go to the label at Universal and pitch them the songs because I work closely with Keith. Mm. I get quick answers. I get I have Keith's ear. Sure. So you know they're just I, I just get results for them. I've got a lot of cuts for a lot of publishers and sure. a lot of songwriters and um, and it's just it's just the, it's just the relationships and it's just staying on top of it and. Um, going in every, you know, every, like, like with the bigger publishers, I meet every other week and hear the new things that's come in. And, and I really like going out to publishing companies. I don't like them coming to me. I really like going out and sitting down and, and listening just cause they might have something, you know, Oh my God, what about this? I totally forgot about this song. And, mm. you know, yeah. instead of, instead of that, instead of them coming to you and they have their three or four or five or how many ever they yeah but some of the boutique like i said some of the smaller publishers it you know uh it's like okay you you really i mean out of five you you know you're going to pitch your your favorite one out of five songs probably if you're a real small publisher so it's really but um just having just having more limited catalog to work with but it's just all about relationships i think and and um publishers want to see um 
um, what's the word? Um, like um, track record. Track like record, success. and they want to see success. Yeah. And 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 another thing that I've really started doing uh, with Tim and Keith, which has been working really great, is we've been having writers camps. Mm. So um, we just finished a writers camp for Tim. And we we cut ended up cutting um, two songs out of the writers camp. Yeah. We did a writers camp. Keith had never done a writers camp. We did a writers camp for the album that's out now. And I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I put the camp together, and Keith said, "Oh my God, this is it sounds very interesting, and I would love to do this." And it was last year around Thanksgiving, and Keith I had it all set, and Keith tried to pull out. And I'm like, oh, my God. And he tried to pull out. And he's so sweet. But he, but he started getting bombarded by all these writers going, let me in the camp. I want to yeah. be, let me, you know, some of his really close friends. And yeah. we'd already had the, you know, it was already kind of full. Mm. And so he felt so bad mm. that, you know, it ve- he's so very conscious about that. Sure. So he almost pulled out. And I'm just like, please, you can't. You can't pull out of this. We got it. Let's just let's 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 work through this. So we work through it. He comes in for the camp and he he does a show on the shopping network where he sells his guitars, I think, mm. yeah. on the home network or whatever it is. So he had flew in. He'd been up. You stay up all night. It's live. Wow. And he, he's been, he was up all night and he plays like for I don't know. He just looked rough. <laughs> and that was all I could say. And he and he could barely talk. And so uh, I left. We got the camp started. He was a little, you could tell he was very anxious about it. And so my assistant at the time, she said, she called me. She said, I think you need to get back here. Keith just told me he was never going to do this again. <laughs> and... And I'm going, oh, my God, he's going to fire me. This is awful. I've, you know, God, he, you know, so I go back and everything, it kind of calmed down. But it went from I am never doing this again to this was great. Let's do wow. this again. Literally the in the end course of, the of like two days. Yeah, or whatever. three days. Two and days. It, he ended up putting four out of the five songs from that camp on the record. Wow. Very strategic, very focused very productive wow and so we're getting ready to do another one at the end of march but yeah wow. yeah so can you talk a little bit about what that i mean that first of all that's an amazing story <laughs> <laughs> um what what is a camp for like people who maybe aren't familiar with that idea what did you kind of go into a house and yeah Keith we is do, there and yeah mm-hmm. we do we we move out of studio uh sound stage or backstage and we have probably about 10 writers mm-hmm. Keith's very involved like with tim i was like okay here's the writers that i want Tim's like okay i don't care mm-hmm. so i was very involved in just picking the writers for the tim count mm-hmm. but with for keith he is very involved mm-hmm. because he's a co-writer tim's not a co-writer and he he's he's pretty much leads the way on who he wants involved in the camps. And we go three days and we cater. We have lunch and breakfast. I mean, we have breakfast and lunch, and then they end about five. And then, um, yeah, it 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 was uh, it was very very good. I was yeah. so excited. That so, it it, out. and is Keith and. Tim kind of bouncing from room to room, or are they well, kind of Keith just... Keith is, but Tim wasn't. Tim wasn't even there. Tim okay. would come in uh, in the mornings and talk to everybody and just kind of cheer them on and, and kind of tell them what he was looking for. Tim's really not a writer. Sure. Uh, but he would tell them what he was looking for, and that helped a lot. Mm. But And that was it. And then Keith is... Keith's a very slow, slow worker, mm. writer. So moving from room to room, that's what freaked him out with the first camp. It was like, oh God, wait a minute, I gotta, I gotta jump to the next ride in two hours, and I haven't even, they haven't even gotten done, you know, into sure. this song. So that was what freaked him out. But we worked it out, and it ended up being great. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's very successful. That's awesome. I am, I am all for that now. I, I, I actually would love to start doing that with. Um, other artist, hmm. if I could, you know, find the right artist, I would love to work with Garth Brooks. Hmm. I feel like I could really help him. Wow. I would love to do something like that with him. Hey, well, it's 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 out on the internet, so if you're hearing this, Garth, <laughs> come on, come on, <laughs> Riders Camp. <laughs> that is awesome. That is a very closed door. Sure, it's very tough. Sure, and ha- so how to get into the Garth world? <laughs> yeah. So h- how do you go about curating? you know, which writers you want for those camps? Uh, well, like for Tim, 
I'll give an example. There was a, a there's a, a young track guy that I've really been liking what I've been hearing him do. And actually, that before the camp, Tim, I had pitched a song that he had done, and he had sent it to me. It was Matt McGinn and mm. Nathan Spicer, mm. and it was called 7500 OBO. And I saw that title come through my email, and I thought, wow, that's a really different title. Mm. That's really interesting. So it, it immediately, I got to hear this. This is such an interesting title. Yeah. And I listened to it, and I just loved it, pitched it to Tim. Uh, but I loved what I've just kind of been listening to Nathan, just been kind of hearing what, what been liking what he had been doing. So I decided, I think, okay, well, I'm going to throw him in on this cam, just see yeah. how he does. Sure. He ended up getting two songs, brand wow. new songwriter, brand new track guy. I think he had had, we well, got the Tim cut. Brianna, has he had any other cuts? Ryan Hurd, Ryan Hurd song. to a T. He okay. wrote that and produced that. I love that, that song. Yeah, so yeah. he wrote that. So he, just a young, you know, up and coming kind of guy, and yeah. he ended up getting two songs cut That's out awesome. of the Tim Count. But um, I just, you know, with t on the Tim Count, it's just writers that I loved. I had Tom Douglas, I had Brian Simpson, I had mm. Matt McGinn. I don't know. It's just, I don't, you know, it's just, it's just people that I just you know, love. Sure. Yes. They're, they're writing. Yeah. But I'm all about the new writers too, though. I love, love finding new writers, mm. love find listening. And, and, um, uh, actually what I'm doing with Keith right now is just sending him writers who I think he might not be, um, aware of like mm. young writers yeah. and sending it to him and saying, here, you need to really listen to this guy. I really like what he does. And, mm. That's kind of where I'm at, with yeah. the process I'm doing with him right now. That's awesome. Well, I love that yeah. you're a part of championing, yeah, yeah. The, the up and comer. So yeah. that's that's yeah. great. How it keeps keeps growing. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything that you've talked a lot about? Um, really, it sounds like kind of publishers and writers step up to start writing better songs in the mm -hmm. Nashville community. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like uh, songwriters and publishers need to maybe change? Are there are there obviously not following the trends, you know, you talked about Stop that. Stop following the tr trends would be the main thing. I'm sorry, okay. go ahead. What else? No, no, no. That's uh, um, uh, um, um, thinking more out of the box. Mm. Um, mm, but just, just don't be followers, you know, mm. stop Stop chasing what's on radio right now. Be thinking about what's going to happen. That's on down the road, you know. That's yeah. Kinda, that's yeah. good. That's awesome. That's just that's the main thing, I think. Good, I good, good advice yeah. to, to to the entire writing community. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we're gonna close up with the lightning round. Is there a song that almost didn't make a record that turned out to be a hit? Well, I don't. Well, I'll tell you this. There's a song. I don't know if y'all remember the song on Tim called "When the Stars Go Blue," Ryan Adams song. Mm. I pitched that song ten times to Tim <laughs> before he cut it. <laughs> so uh, that's not really answering your question. I can't really think of a song that almost made the record that was a big hit. I will say Tim passed on the song for uh, How Forever Feels. That was a big hit mm. on Kenny. Yeah. Uh, Tim cut it and didn't make the album, and then Kenny cut it, and it was a big hit on <laughs> Kenny. Uh, let's see. Um, mm, um, I know there's, uh, there's so many that, oh, yes. Okay, there's one song that's, okay. So there's a song, uh, Break Up in the End. Yeah. I was pitched that song. It was a cr crappy work tape. Mm. Um, oh, another song, Live Like You Were Dying. Lori McKenna, I could go on and on about yeah. her. Yeah. But um, a song called Break Up in the End, I was pitched that song, and it was just a crappy work tape. And I knew that song was I, I knew that song was going to be a big song, and I tried mm. to get Tim to do it. I tried to get Keith to do it. Wow. I, you know, I, and that song haunted me because I knew, and sure enough, you know, yeah. It, yeah nominated yeah. for a Grammy and Song of the Year and all. So it's hard hearing yeah. songs like that and not being able to get your guys into it. <laughs> That's so hard. But that one in particular, I was like, oh, God, I know this song is going to be such a hit. Yeah. <laughs> and it was. It yeah. absolutely was. Yeah. Um, is there anyone in music? Okay, well, 
may, you might have already answered this, but is there anyone in music that you want to work with or meet that you haven't already yet? I would love to work with Garth Brooks. I just feel like I could really, really help him. It's mm. good. Yeah. Favorite music movie or documentary? Um, there's a documentary documentary out. Oh, that guy, I love documentary. There's so many. Um, the music documentaries, The Eagles. I love that one. I love mm. the Tom Petty. But there's the movie out now about the war that's the documentary. Do y'all know the one I'm talking about? Uh-uh. Um, that you, it's literally... Um, you're seeing what the, uh, the 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 people back in like 1900s or 19 or 1800s. It's real footage. Oh wow! It's in the theater now, wow. and it's a documentary. And I saw a little bit of that, and that I love it. But I love music documentaries, and I love. Um, have y'all have y'all seen Abducted in Plain Sight? I have the it. document. I have it. <laughs> I love things about that, but yeah, but music, music docs are, are my. I love okay. them. Okay, yeah. awesome. Uh, favorite Nashville meeting spot? Coffee and coconuts. Feel free to plug that. That coffee is a coconuts. great place. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, no. No. Coffee and coconuts. Um, 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 I don't. I don't like to go to offices much. I don't like to be. I'm not an office type girl, you know. Yeah. I love to be at coffee shops and sure. all co- whatever. I love Barista Par. We do a lot of meetings there. But, yeah, and I'll plug uh, it for her. Coffee and Coconuts is amazing. It's a great coffee shop in Franklin. Would you, was it safe to say it's your side hustle? Is that? Is it's that my what? side hustle. Yes. I real quickly. I uh, was looking for something other than just. The music business has always it's just been everything music in our house and I was just looking for something different to do never set out for it to be a coffee shop I was sitting at a little Mexican restaurant one day Tito's and I thought oh my god that would be the cutest little place for a coffee shop mm. and I called about it it, had, it was supposed to be a UPS store three months later I get a call and say well it's not going to be a UPS store are you interested in a coffee shop uh, yeah I am so I Went to school on uh, just really focused in on coffee shop for a year and Pinterest hit Pinterest really hard as far as ideas and studying. Went to Crema classes at Crema. That's awesome. Uh, to learn about coffee and yeah, so it, it, it just before I knew it, it was like, oh my goodness, here we are. <laughs> but it's doing great. Two years, June second. Yeah, I'd love to dive a little more into the side hustle part, and we're gonna do a little bonus clip kind of on that, just because it's fascinating to me. And yeah, oh, I'm, I'm gonna interested. say one thing: yeah. the coffee shop. I have, I, I, we do writers' nights there, and okay. I, when I wanted to do the coffee shop, I wanted to do it in support of. Me loving me, I love coffee, I love music, and I love the beach, so that's why it looks like it does. But I also wanted to hire people, young artists, young writers, young that's the people I wanted to employ mm. to do something, you know, something like the coffee mule town coffee, yeah, out of Columbia is a bunch of songwriters from Muscle Shoals, and yeah. I just knew I wanted to carry their coffee because I love these. I, yeah. You know, so. And it's fantastic coffee. Yeah, it is. So, yeah. So yeah, we, we are going to do a little bonus okay. uh, segment with her. Check it out at madeitmusic.com on the episodes page for her. We're going to talk about the side hustle. But the last lightning round question, one thing that you think will be very different in the music biz five years from now? I, I don't think there's going to be, I don't think there'll be terrestrial radio anymore. I really don't. I, I think the streaming is coming on strong. I think... Um, I don't know how relevant labels st- will be five years from now. That's the big question. I know right now you still need them, but I don't know. Five or six years from now, I don't know. Yeah. That's in, it, it remains to be seen. I don't know. It's good. Yeah. It's good answer. Well, Missy, thank you so much. Yeah. I feel like I oh learned God. a ton. Oh, I'm looking forward like to going I back and rambled. listening to it. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's been with Missy Gallimore here on the Made It Music Podcast. Thanks again. Hey, what's up? Thanks for hanging out on this YouTube video with us. In case you didn't know, this is from the Made It Music Podcast Season 2. We have a ton of awesome guests that come on the show, all music business professionals, to share their knowledge and experience with you. So if you want to subscribe to not miss any future episodes, hit that subscribe button on YouTube and you'll be notified about all of them. 
And in case you didn't know, we do a deep dive for every episode where we go really in depth on a certain topic from each podcast episode. So sign up right here to get free unlimited access to all of those deep dives from our podcast. And if you want to watch another Made It in Music podcast video, click here.